I'd like to take a look at polyphase power in this video, and we'll start with single phase. The end goal of the next sequence of videos is to show in a very detailed way why three-phase power distribution systems are superior to single-phase or two-phase power distribution systems. Let's start with a single-phase case and work our way up to the three-phase case. A single-phase power distribution system is the type of system that you're probably most familiar with. That's the kind of power system that we've been studying so far in this lecture series. We have an AC source, a two-wire distribution system, and a load. I'm going to assume that the load is resistive. Now, in real life, a lot of loads might be reactive. We might have motors, we might have inductive loads, capacitive loads, but I'm going to assume that in a very large network, all of these reactive loads can be balanced. We know, for example, that inductive loads have positive reactances, capacitive loads have negative reactances, and as long as you have roughly equal numbers of both of these types of loads, they should balance to create a net resistive load. We're going to assume resistive loads in all of the slides that follow. In a single phase distribution system, we have a single AC source. One of the two wires coming out of the source is typically called hot. The return wire is typically called neutral. The entire world operates at either 50 hertz or 60 hertz. Let's take the 50 hertz world as an example. I'm in Singapore now, it operates at 50 hertz. Continental Europe also uses 50 hertz. In a 50 hertz locality, it means that the entire power distribution system is in phase with itself at 50 hertz. That means that all of the generation facilities have to be in phase. All of the turbines have to spin together across very large geographical distances. Let's take a look at one of these turbines specifically. Now this animation shows how a typical turbine might operate. It's a little bit simplified here, but I think it will give you an idea of the basic principles behind power generation. Let's take a magnet and assume that it's spinning at a constant rotational velocity. When that magnet passes underneath a coil, current will be induced in the coil. Now the direction the current will flow will be dependent on whether the north pole is aligned with the magnet or whether the south pole is aligned with the magnet. As the magnet spins, in this particular configuration, a sine wave will appear in the current. If the load is resistive, because V equals IR, the voltage and the current are in phase with one another and the voltage is also sinusoidal. The power delivered to the load is V squared over R, or equivalently I squared R. If we take the square of the voltage and divide it by a constant resistance, then we get the power graph, which you are also seeing. The power delivered to the load is pulsed, and the power output from the turbine is also pulsed. That's not good, and that's something that we can improve upon when we move to either two-phase or three-phase turbines. You'll see this in a moment. Let's calculate the speed that a turbine would have to spin in order to give us a 50 hertz grid frequency. Period is 1 divided by frequency, and our turbine is going to need to spin 50 times per second in order to create a period of 1 50th of a second. Let's convert it to RPMs. What we're really interested in when we calculate the rotational velocity of the turbine is the angular frequency omega. The units of omega, when we use this formula 2 pi f, wind up to be radians per second. 2 pi radians is 360 degrees, or 1 revolution. The turbine needs to spin around 50 times per second. In order to get RPMs, I just need to convert seconds to minutes. For those regions of the world where the operating frequency of the grid is 60 Hz rather than 50 Hz, all of the turbines would instead spin at 3600 RPMs. It turns out that these two rotational velocities are just nice for turbine operating efficiencies. That's one reason why our electrical grids operate at these particular frequencies and why they don't operate, for example, at 1 hertz or 1 kilohertz. What's interesting, though, about the world and what's bad to a certain extent is that we have two different frequencies. And, of course, this has historical reasons. It's not good because these two systems are completely incompatible with one another. You can't take a turbine that's been optimized for rotational velocities of 3,000 RPMs and then spin it up to 3,600 RPMs and hope that it has the same efficiency. Typically, turbines are designed for use at one particular rotational velocity. We can't just convert an electrical grid that operates at 50 Hz into one that operates at 60 Hz. 
This has been a big problem for certain areas of the world. For example, in Japan, they have a very unique situation where there are two different operating frequencies in the same country. The Tokyo region of Japan and the eastern part of Japan operates at 50 Hz, but western Japan, including Osaka, operates at 60 Hz. There are historical reasons for this difference, but it effectively means that Japan has two different independent power grids and they can't talk to one another. They can't share electricity very easily. This was a big problem during the Fukushima crisis that struck Japan. One part of Japan had power to spare and the other part of Japan was not able to accept it because of these two different grid frequencies. And that's really a shame, but it's very difficult to solve this sort of problem because one can't simply change turbines without incurring huge costs. Let's go back to our simple turbine diagram for a moment. And I wanna point something out. You might notice that we have space here for more magnets. Why don't we put a horizontal magnet in addition to a vertical magnet? If we put more magnets in this turbine, can we improve the situation with the pulsed power? And could we make the grid any better? You can probably see that at least we might be able to squeeze some more power out of the turbine without increasing the physical size of the turbine too much. That's number one. But can we make some other improvements to the grid too? We can, and I'll show you how that's done with two-phase power and three-phase power. Let's first take a look at two-phase power. In a two-phase power distribution system, we have effectively two turbines, but the voltages generated by each of the two turbines, or each of the two magnets, are out of phase with one another by 90 degrees. By the way, when I'm talking about two-phase power here, this is different than the type of split-phase power that's common in North American residential electricity installations, all right? For split-phase power, the two phases in a house are out of phase by 180 degrees. Here I'm talking about a hypothetical situation where the two phases are 90 degrees out of phase with one another. It's a different situation. Notice with two-phase power that we almost have two independent circuits. Each of them has two wires to distribute the power. We have two independent loads and we have two circuits within a single turbine that are not connected to one another. Let's call one of these phases phase one and let's call the other phase, phase two. Because the magnetic field from the magnet crosses the two coils at different times, the two phases are going to be 90 degrees out of phase with one another according to the geometry of the turbine. Effectively though, these are two independent circuits. This could be a graph of the voltages coming out of the two lines, but it could also be considered to be a graph of the two currents, assuming that we have resistive loads. Again, if we have resistive loads, then the power is effectively just the square of the voltage divided by some constant. The power in each of the two phases is pulsed, but the powers are out of phase with one another. This is interesting because it means that from the perspective of the turbine, we have pulsed power coming out of the vertical section of the turbine, and we have pulsed power coming out of the horizontal section of the turbine. But what if I think about the power coming out of the turbine as a whole? Is it still pulsed or not? Well, let's take a look by adding these two phase powers together. Of course, the voltages are out of phase with one another. The individual powers are out of phase with one another. But if I take those two powers and add them together, it turns out that the power coming out of the turbine as a whole is constant. That has a lot of advantages. And some of the advantages come when one wants to drive a motor. You could arrange a motor in the same way that you've arranged your turbine. You could have four different magnets, apply exactly the four wires that come from the power generation facility, and then the magnet inside the motor at the load would spin at the same speed as the turbine. That has a lot of advantages because the motor is then self-starting. This constant flow of power from the turbine overall is an advantage of two-phase power, but it turns out that there's another advantage too, and it's related to the amount of copper that's needed for the distribution network. You'll notice that there's four wires here on this schematic representing the power distribution system. We have two hot wires and two neutral wires. The currents are out of phase with one another, but it turns out that we don't necessarily need to have four wires. I'll show how that plays out in a future video. For now, I'd like to look at the case of three-phase power so that you know what it is. In a three-phase power distribution system, it turns out that we have three different sources 120 degrees out of phase with one another. We would have three different loads, again, assumed to be resistive, 
the currents going through these loads would be out of phase with one another by 120 degrees as well. Let's take a look at the turbine. As the magnet cuts across different coils, we end up getting sine waves from each coil independently. But overall, we get three sine waves. And unlike the case with two phase power, these sine waves are spaced out evenly. That turns out to be an advantage because the voltage between any two phases is constant with respect to time. Again, just like the situation with two phase power, the power in any individual phase is pulsed, but when you add the power delivered by the turbine as a whole, that is when you add the power supplied by each of the three phases, it turns out to be constant. Therefore, the three phase situation is advantageous compared to the two phase situation. The power flow is still constant from the turbine, but you can see from the graph of the voltage that it's a more symmetric situation or a more even scenario. It turns out that there's a third advantage to using three phase power, and it's related to the amount of copper that needs to be spent in building the power distribution system. It turns out that three phases saves copper compared to the two phase case and also compared to the single phase case. In the next video, we'll take a look at the two phase situation in more detail, and then we'll move on to the three phase situation after that. We have a whole series of professionally filmed and edited videos in order to help students learn the fundamentals of electricity. If you like watching this particular video, then you might like to check out some of our others too.